Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination. Visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From recipes, motivational posts, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and the reader's favorite regular weekly post, this and that, which goes live on the blog every Friday. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 289th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today, I am so honored to bring to you a conversation I had with a guest who I'm still pinching myself. I had the opportunity to have on the show. Anne Willen is the founder of La Varenne Cooking School, which was in Paris. It opened its doors in 1975 and offered the first of its kind French and English instruction for the culinary arts. As Anne will explain in our conversation, what made this school unique and surpass those cooking schools that were present at that time is impressive. Not only were you learning to cook from experts in the culinary fields of French cuisine, but you were also learning the French language. Anne Willen's new book is Women in the Kitchen, 12 Essential Cookbook Writers Who Define the Way We Eat from 1661 to Today, which includes more than 50 recipes, a handful from each of the 12 women she spotlights in chronological order. We will talk about a handful of the women she spotlights, including Lydia Child, Julia Child, Edna Lewis, and more as well as talk about what Anne loves about food, how she came to be someone who enjoys diving into the history, and so much more. She joined me from London recently, and I want to thank her for taking the time. Now to our conversation, Anne Willen. It is an honor to have on the show today a woman who is rightly considered one of the world's preeminent authorities on French cooking, a James Beard Award-winning author and the founder of La Varenne Cooking School in Paris, Anne Willen. Her latest book was released just this past August, Women in the Kitchen, profiling 12 essential cookbook writers who define the way we eat from 1661 to today. I am excited to have her on the show to talk more about these women and the topic of food and history. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate, Anne. Very glad to be with you. A historian uh, you are of of the culinary world, um, through this in-depth research into each of these women, readers who both love food, also love history and language will, will, I am confident, thoroughly enjoy what you have shared in your book. Um, Just as an example, um, you walk us through language. The simple word pantry, for example, is derived um, from the French word pan, which we know means bread, and then larder, and lard meaning bacon. So both words describe a storage area of supplies. What did you most enjoy about working on this project? I think it was being taken back into the past. I'm thinking of actually having something like a larder. I mean, they basically, a a larder, that's to say, a cool, cold place where you could keep lard, meaning bacon and ham, doesn't exist in the modern household. Though, in fact, I was brought up with one. Long time ago in Yorkshire. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, my goodness. So we stored eggs in something called an Isinglass. Okay. 
which seals the, the, the shell so you can keep eggs through the winter. And we had um, uh, a fat oh, piece of, of bacon hanging and a ham. And that's when I was a very small girl. But I always loved the kitchen, so I always noticed what went on in the kitchen. So you were a keen observer from a very young age. Is that what led you to become curious about the history of the culinary world through your career? Well, it probably did. I mean, my subsequent career was nothing to do with history. I have um, an MA in economics. Oh, wow. Yes, I know. To that, I was sort of sideways. <laughs> but in fact, economics is a balance of stresses and strains and, I don't know, somehow that also links into recipes. That's true. And, and some of the women you wrote about, what, what they were writing about in their cooks, the frugal, um, the frugal handbook, you have a handful of these women who they're not just tending to recipes or sharing recipes. They're trying to give a guide for other individuals in the kitchen, specifically women, to live well in that particular time period. Indeed they are. And they're talking about how to run, not, how to, not just cook, but also to run the kitchen to grow the vegetables, to generally manage the household. And what I what I thought was interesting is that, and you put each of these women from 1661 to current day in chronological order, and you see them influencing or being influenced by the previous women before them. And I want to talk about a few of those connections. Um, for many of the women, their cookbooks or career trick trajectories were influenced indirectly or directly by the women who came before them in this book. And Lydia Child, whom I actually had never heard of until I read your book, so thank you for introducing me to her, you share that she was a remarkably modern character who lived between the years, just for listeners to know, 1802 to 1880, and she has no relation to Julia Child, just for those of us to know. And while she writes about how to be frugal, a frugal housewife, she actually exemplified a woman of her own mind and was a very forward thinking person in politics. And many, when they think of her name, who know her, think of her first as a civil rights leader. Can you talk a little bit about Lydia Child? She was a New Englander. Um, she was married, possibly not very happily, to a man who was not very successful. And indeed, at one stage, was declared bankrupt. And she very much ran the household, which she had no children, though she would have been very strict. Um, the book she wrote was a domestic encyclopedia. There are only 40. Um, she wrote many books. She wrote more than one novel. She wrote books for children. She wrote books on politics, on all sorts of things. Um, but the encyclopedia, um, she talks about what the children should be doing. And she was desperately strict. And they should look after their own clothes um, from the age of five onwards, and they would be sent to pick the berries from the current trees, and they're all full of spines, but children have to get used to that. So she, she, she was a bit of a martinet. Is that an American word? I'm not sure. I don't think so. What does that mean? Oh, it's a, a martinet means somebody who is a bit prickly and quite strict. Okay. I never heard that. You taught me something else besides all the other things I learned in your book. I sincerely appreciate the, the, the depth of research you, you provide for each of these women. Um, as I said, the language, as an English teacher myself, I really enjoyed the language exploration you did on a lot of these terms. 
where they came from that we use so readily now, but we don't really look as into why they, they existed. I want to keep talking about how different women in this book influenced each other. I want to talk about the connection between Edna Lewis and Alice Waters. Um, Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you wrote that um, Edna Lewis most notably inspired Alice Waters. And for many um, of us on this, uh, the listeners know that she is the founder of Chez Panisse in Berkeley, California. But you write that she showed Alice the glories of an American tradition worthy of comparison to the most evolved cuisine on earth a tradition of simplicity and purity and sheer deliciousness that is only possible when food tastes like what it is. Can you explain how Edna Lewis revealed this truth to Alice? Well, Edna um, lived a very simple childhood. She was brought up, brought up almost, one can say, in the backwoods of Virginia, part of um, a black family whose parents clearly were intelligent and very anxious that their children, even if they were living very simply, should have a good intellectual education. And so they had a young man as a lodger who taught the children And so Edna, though living a simple life, helping to gather what needed gathering at the different times of year, like wild strawberries and, oh, the fruits and vegetables that were in what I'm sure would be a very simple garden, that she, Edna became very linked to the land. And so her recipes are simple, but, oh, ideally linked to the ingredients that were available to her at the time that she was writing her books. Most interestingly to me, because I was brought up in the countryside, the ingredients and ideas that emerged when she was a child. The festivals at the different times of year, they were churchgoers. I think it would be church, might be what I'd call chapel, Um, but certainly linked in to harvest festivals, Christmas, that kind of thing. Very seasonal and celebratory, but recognizing that this is a once, this is an annual event or this is a seasonal event and we'll celebrate it now, but not forever until it comes around. Indeed. I see. And then she moved to New York where it must have been a total revolution for her because central New York, she ended up running a rather trendy cafe in central New York, where people like Teddy Roosevelt came to visit. But in between moving up to New York, where I think her sister probably was already, and finding her own way, she really became a well-known woman. She was striking in appearance, above six feet and um, very handsome. She robe like dresses in brilliant colors. It reminds me slightly um, of the charisma and persona of Julia Child, who was also over six feet and also wore brilliant colors. Okay. So you met Edna Lewis and I know you've met Julia Child. What were some what are some of the memories that you have of meeting Edna for the first time? If you have I that. have never met Edna. Never did. Okay, I didn't know. I didn't think no, so, but I was I've just sure. seen one or two photographs, um, all of them in black and white. So one needs okay. to rely on the descriptions of other people. Okay. 
I did not know she was that tall. I, I don't know why. I just, she must have been, as you said, striking and quite a presence. And um, that's, oh, that's wonderful. I, something that she has in common um, with Julia Child is if they, they both have the same editor as Marcella Hazan. All three of these women had Judith Jones as their editor. And I did not know much about Marcella Hazan. And I would like to talk about her a little bit. Yes, me. Because, yeah, she, you share that she created the new standard for authentic Italian cooking in America. And in fact, she actually follows Julia Child in, in your book. And you write that once French food became learned and, and more of a more of a national awareness in America, Italian was the next obvious choice. I love mm-hmm. that you wrote that. However, instead of taking her talents, Marcella's talents to the screen, she opened up a cooking school and wrote multiple cooking books. What did Marcella Hazan do for Italian food in America that we still see in our lives today? Oh, well, Marcella, um, French cooking is can be sim- can be a great many different things. It can be regional, simple dishes. It can be historical. It can be very structured with a classical structure. Um, And all of those views give you a different viewpoint of French cooking. Marcella insisted Italian cooking was not like that. It was the regional dishes that you find in different parts, or find in different parts of Italy, that use local ingredients as eaten um, and enjoyed on the spot. And so she and Julia took a very different approach to cooking and in their recipes. All right, we're going to take a quick break because we need to introduce you to our sponsors. But when we come back, Ann Willen's going to talk about her relationship with Julia Child and something that many of us may not know about her that would delight us. She's also going to share what she misses about her cooking school, La Varenne. And she has a couple of petite plaisirs she's going to share with us. I'll be right back. If there is something that is preventing you from achieving your goals or living the life that you want to live, BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Connect in a safe and private online environment that is also convenient. As you can start communicating in under 24 hours, this is not self-help. It is professional counseling. You can send a message to your counselor at any time. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can even schedule weekly phone sessions or video sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. Now, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating a great therapeutic match, so they make it easy and free to change counselors at any time if needed. Now, this is also more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available no matter where you live. BetterHelp is there for their clients worldwide with a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. So search for a licensed counselor in a variety of specialized areas, such as anger, stress, anxiety, relationships, trauma, grief, self-esteem, LGBT matters. Anything you share is confidential and it's convenient because it's on your schedule on video or phone sessions. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Now, as a simple, sophisticated listener, I want to help you start living a happier life today. So you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash simple. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash simple. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Issue. If you live to create, then you know that having a final finished product that you are proud of is key. Now, you're finally done editing. You've created something fantastic. It needs to be the best it can be. Now you just need to format and reformat it for every single platform. But with Issue, you just have to make it once and it's ready to post everywhere. 
Now, Issue is the all-in-one platform to create and distribute beautiful digital publications from brochures to magazines to sales collateral and more. I have used Issue on the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, to create past seasonal shopping guides for the new upcoming fall and spring season. And the quality is top notch. Issue makes it easy to create eye-catching content. Simply upload your PDFs and files and Issue transforms them using your vision and customized templates to create the content you want. With Issue, you create it once and distribute it everywhere. Everything is optimized to post on your website and social platforms like Instagram and Facebook. They can even help you make animated Instagram stories. And you can also start using Issue for free to try it out. And you can also start using Issue for free and step up to their premium features that give you a more customized experience. As a simple, sophisticated listener, get started with Issue today for free. Or if you sign up for a premium account, you will get 50% off when you go to issue.com slash podcast and use the promo code sophisticate. That's issue, I-S-S-U-U dot com slash podcast. Use the promo code sophisticate at checkout for your free account or 50% off your premium account. That's issue.com slash podcast with promo code sophisticate. Bombas, the maker of the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. They've literally rethought every little detail of the socks we wear to make them more comfortable. And I'm loving them. I wear them on my walks every single day. I have more Bomba socks going in rotation and they have been going in rotation for six months and they are still in top-notch condition. But these socks do more than just keep your feet cozy. They give back to the most vulnerable members of our community. Because for every pair of socks you purchase, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. The generosity of Bombas customers has allowed them to donate over 34 million pairs of socks and counting through their nationwide network of 3,000 plus giving partners. And the impact is more powerful than ever. To those experiencing homelessness, these socks represent the dignity of putting on clean clothes, a small comfort that's especially important right now. As a simple, sophisticated listener, you can give a pair when you buy a pair. Get 20% off your first purchase at bombas.com slash sophisticate. That's bombas, B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate for 20% off your first purchase. Bombas.com slash sophisticate. Now let's get back into our conversation with Anne Willen. And we're talking about, we're wrapping up our discussion about Marcella Hazan. And I, and I mistakenly did not pronounce the C hard enough in our original conversation. So I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Marcella Hazan. And now we're going to take it into a conversation about Anne Willen and her cooking school in Paris, La Varenne. She and oh, what was it that I was reading about her that was so fascinating? She didn't want to be on TV, and she could have been on TV. She really did dive into the the, the writing and the teaching of it, the more hands on with direct connection with her students and her her readers. You yourself had a, you know your own cooking school, La Marin, a well renowned one. What is it that drew you to make, creating a cooking school, and what do you think drew drew Marcella to that as well? Uh, well, in my own case. Um, like Julia, about five years before me, or a bit more than that perhaps, though I never met her then, I went to the Cordon Bleu in Paris, and I was shocked by what I found. There were no written recipes. Classes were given in a basement by um, an excellent old chef, but who regarded it as a job not as a calling. The equipment was also almost non-existent. And after I'd been there 18 months, so I could get the grand diploma, and he learned a great deal. I thought to myself, it shouldn't be like this. One day I will open my own school. And... In between, I moved to the States, had children, met Julia, and Julia and I talked a lot about what a school in Paris for um, basically foreigners, Americans usually, to learn to cook French cooking the way the French do it, 
and that we talked a good deal about how we thought it ought to be. And so about five years later, when my husband and I and the children moved to Paris, I opened Lava and Cooking School. That's 1975. And I wish I had had the opportunity to have attended, but I've spoken to people who have, and they just speak so fondly of their experience. What what do you miss? Or I know around for over 30 years. What do you miss about having that school? Well, I miss having the students and passing on, hopefully, what I know about French cooking and would like to pass on to others. But above all, I miss working with the chefs Ah. because we had two or three, not very many, resident chefs. I always insisted that they must be French, French trained, and teach in French with translation and written recipes, recipes in English, which meant quite a complicated structure, in fact, because we needed translators to translate for the chefs. None of them spoke English. Oh, my goodness. I had a system of trainees who needed to be more or less bilingual, who could simultaneously translate for the chefs. Um, They came as trainees. They learned a great deal, didn't get paid, but they learned a lot. It was a very vivid, vibrant place with all sorts of personalities headed by a wonderful old chef who had had two stars in his day and whose specialty was the most difficult of all ingredients, which is fish. Oh, I didn't, okay, why is fish considered the most difficult? What is? Because it must be fresh. Okay. And it's very quickly cooked. Oh, sure so that it easily overdoes, and you can get it underdone, slightly underdone, overdone. But, I mean, two minutes can make all the difference. That's true. That's a good point. And it was just terrific at that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I can't imagine the memories you have. I can't even imagine. I've been trying to get a, get ahead on all your books, but you have a lot of books out there. I'm just I I am just amazed and inspired by all that you have created and shared with us. So if no the the school may not be around more, but your books are out there, so we as newbies can definitely learn. I I do have a quick question about Julia Child if you don't mind me asking. I know you were dear friends with her. Um and I was reading your book you know, and I've read a lot about Julia Child, but I honestly didn't realize she was so private um, because um, what was it that I read in um, a biography about her? That her personal phone number was in the phone book and she would take phone calls from people at her house in Cambridge. And that just shocked me. And so then when I read in your book, you shared that she was instinctively private, which might surprise people. Um, what what else might people be surprised and delighted to know about Julia Child? Well, if you were in her kitchen, you joined in with whatever was going on. And I remember going in one day, and um, she had a very good butcher down the road road called Mr. Savannah. And she got a big rib of beef. And she said, oh, she said, you must make the Yorkshire pudding because she knew I'd come <laughs> from Yorkshire. Okay. And so instantly, and anyone who walked in the kitchen was instantly absorbed into what was going on. So I was put on to making the Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> um, it was quite tricky because there was only one oven. And so the meat was cooking there and the Yorkshire pudding had to cook there too. And Yorkshire pudding, uh, oh, I can't remember what you call them in the States. But anyway. Um, popovers or what are, we, what are we, I don't know what we call popovers. them. Popovers. Yeah, is that what it is? Okay. Yeah, so they're a popover. 
And as you know, with popovers, you have to watch them. I mean, they take a certain amount of time and then you need to take them out. Um, And that didn't necessarily accord with a roast of beef. So she she knew her audience. She knew the people that she had in her kitchen and she let them shine or do what they had expertise or knowledge in, it sounds like. Yes, and there was always something that needed doing. Someone had given us some truffles, Mm. uh, fresh truffles. And she said, oh, she said, and put me to scrubbing them with a little nail brush um, at the sink to get rid of the earth that lingers in among the the, uh, the kind of crusty outside. There was always something that needed doing. It definitely would make, I would think, make you feel included or part of it and all just kind of part of a, a contributing unit. Very much so. And you learned something. And she always liked a bit of gossip. <laughs> She'd always heard the latest about something or other. Oh, really? I did not know that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I know she always stayed up on the news. She was very aware of what was going on in the world. Um, That's right. Okay. I mean, she would be all into this current election. And I'm sure. Biden and all of that. Yeah. Well, and I read her book that shared her letters with... Um, is it Ava? Yeah. And that's where I realized, oh, she was on top of what was going on in the world. I did not, it doesn't really come out in her other cook. I mean, you just, she focuses on her food. So that was, that was interesting. And I appreciated reading that. Um, but she liked to. Yeah, she was a really intelligent woman, Julia. That's what, yeah. Cover her just as a cook, but she was much more than that. Okay. Yeah. That's what it's, that's what Every time I read something more that deepens that that awareness. Mm-hmm. Well, in all the women that you write about, you write that each one of these women is remarkable. And one of the reasons I found this to be true as I was reading it was that each one was strong minded and, and pursued and shared their own experience and knowledge about food. In each way, they were pioneers. You've worked, as we've just talked about, and been good friends with some of the women you wrote about. Some of them you 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 don't know, but you've done so much history on them. It feels like you probably know them. What do you hope readers will discover as they make their way through this book about the women who influenced how we live and eat today? Well, I think there's a thread that runs through for all good cooking, which is that you need the right ingredients that are fresh, and the way they should be, and it does not at all necessarily mean that they're fancy or expensive ingredients. And um, all these cooks treated them with care in the way they manipulate them, cutting them up, um, in, in the cooking of them. And all of them, of course, are intelligent women. Some were more intellectual than others. Um, Amelia Simmons, I find very interesting. She was very early. Not a great deal is known about her, really, if anything, from her book, which is um, 1796. You can gather that she lives in New England, that she's a simple woman. She describes herself as an orphan, almost certainly was self-taught. And her book is a wonderful picture of almost pioneer frontier life and living off the land, living of the simple ingredients that you have. And then you have, well, Fanny Farmer, I find rather tiresome and didactic. (laughs) Everybody, do you have a Fanny Farmer? You know, I don't, but I I know the name. And so when I picked up your book, I was like, I want to get to know her a bit more. Very particular. But she invented or certainly developed 
um, modern recipe writing in the sense that she has a title, a little descriptive line, then the ingredients in order of appearance in the recipe with their quantities, and then the written instructions of what to do. And that is a style that we still follow. And she was not exactly the very first person to do that, but pretty well. The most well-known, because she had the Boston uh, Cooking School, and that's her most famous cookbook, correct? The Boston Cooking School cookbook? Indeed. Okay. I see, yeah. Well, she, yeah, and she influenced, as you said, um, the joy of cooking um, and so many more that came after her with that style. But the most interesting, possibly, um, with joy of cooking, because Irma Romba was in the center of the States and she covered all food from all over the United States the first cookbook to do so. So she is a universal book. Um, early 1930s was a book. And there are recipes from East and West, California, North and South. She herself was of German extraction, um, though born in the States. And it is a book that anyone throughout the United States will find familiar recipes that they were brought up with. Yeah, quite a staple. I mean, we still see mm-hmm. it in the kitchens today. So also, watch out a book that is regularly updated. So the original was from the 1930s, but that has been updated and updated. Right. So a fairly old edition of Joy of Cooking is what I'd recommend. I was one. I was just going to ask you that. Would you recommend the original or the updates? And I've heard I've heard the original of this particular cookbook that we're talking about. The Joy of Cooking is is the best one to keep. Is the best. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for confirming that. I was going to ask you that. Um, that's one thing that readers may not know who haven't picked this book up. You include a handful of recipes from each of these women's cookbooks. You you write them um, so that they're accessible to us today, but they are their recipes. Um, is there one that you recipe you want to talk about that um, in that maybe would tempt our taste buds to to peruse this book for the recipes as well as the historical information? Well, it depends how adventurous you want to be. I mean, we're running up to Thanksgiving, and there's a nice, simple little cranberry tart um, that I'd recommend. Cranberry tarts. Yes, Edna's recipes I really recommend as being very simple, though actually she has one that's slightly more complicated that would be just great for Thanksgiving, which is quail casserole with mushrooms and grapes. That does look really good. Now, you see, quail would have been running about in the woods when she was a child. That's true. And the mushrooms would have been growing out there. And um, they were growing grapes in the garden on her property, she was would be sent to pick the grapes. Mm. I mean, it was nothing fancy. They would just have had a little arboretum kind of, you know, grapes hanging from a rope or something. Oh, this would be a delicious recipe for fall. Thank you for bringing that. Yes, it would. Yes, it? it would. We have my my mother. They, I grew up out in the country in eastern Oregon. And, we would have quail and that was actually, I had, we had more quail than chicken when I was growing up. And so it's been a rare occasion that I've had quail as an adult. And this is a good reminder. I might have to share that with my mom because that will be something that we can so do together. Nice. Yeah. Little things there. Yeah. Quite hard to find. That was, they are hard to find. That's true. Well, I have one last question for you, Anne, and it's um, as we wrap up, 
every episode of my podcast, we end with a petite plaisir, a sharing of a little something that makes the everyday all the more enjoyable. And so as the guest of the show today, you have that honor. What is a petite plaisir or a simple luxury you enjoy to elevate your everydays? Well, I'm going to suggest two. because. Oh, <laughs> well, one is a slice of cheese. Oh. It can be almost any cheese except stinky cheeses. <laughs> and the other is a fruit. From up the road, um, we have a wonderful, wonderful bakery called Evelina. Uh, and they make the world's best macaroons. Mm. That sounds lovely. That sounds lovely. Pair that with a cup of tea and I will be, yeah, that sounds like a lovely way to spend an afternoon. They may be online, not sure, but you'd have to live in London. Okay. <laughs> well, that's definitely a reason to visit. I, there's all sorts of reasons. I cannot wait to return. Thank you for sharing too. I always love having more than one. So thank you for sharing too. Good. L- <laughs> listeners, Anne Willand's new book is Women in the Kitchen, 12 Essential Cookbook Writers Who Define the Way We Eat from 1661 to Today. A handful of recipes are are included in the book as well. It is out now. Thank you so much for joining me today, Anne. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Now, I have shared all of Anne's petite plaisir information on today's show notes the simply luxurious life.com slash podcast 289 as well i couldn't help but ask her after our conversation had wrapped up recording what were her favorite teas since she is british and we have many anglophiles who tune into this podcast and she did share with me some of her favorites and what she does and doesn't like to do to her tea as well as a favorite nibble that she pairs with her tea so many petite plaisirs in today's episode be sure to check out the show notes for those as well as visit for the links to her current book and all of her cookbooks and memoirs i'm so excited to have had this opportunity and i want to thank you for tuning in i'll be back next monday with a brand new episode bonjour Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up my latest book, Living the Simply Luxurious Life, Making Your Everydays Extraordinary and Discovering Your Best Self, now available on Audible and wherever audiobooks are sold, as well as in paperback and ebook versions. You can also pick up my first book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's guide, which is also available in paperback, ebook, and as an audiobook as well. To stay caught up on the most recent episodes of the podcast, blog post, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your weekend, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox each Friday to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or cup of morning coffee. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.